Dr. McLaren, guests, welcome to this The Road Ahead lecture run by Engineering Scotland and very kindly hosted by the University of Strathclyde. Uh, welcome specifically to Jim Mather, whom I haven't actually seen tonight. Is he here? <laughs> Hello, Jim. Uh, I saw your name on the, the list. Jim was, in fact, our very first Road Ahead speaker. At that time, he was a, a minister in the, the Scottish government, but uh, he, he's now moved on to um, commerce, so uh, definitely a step in the right direction. That was seven years ago, in 2008, and it certainly set the tone for the Road Ahead Lectures uh, and given us very hard act to follow. So thank you for that, Jim. J Jim also has been a very good attender at the, the Road Ahead over the years uh, and has only missed very, very few of them. So welcome here tonight. Also welcome to Diana McLaren, who's the daughter of Professor uh, John Butt. Now, of course, you've all done your homework uh, done your auxiliary reading, and you'll realise that uh, Professor John Butt was the PhD supervisor of the then Mr. Tom Devine. We have apologies tonight from Alan Ingalls, the Vice Principal of Glasgow Kelvin College, Professor Muffy Calder, the Chief Scientist, and um, Professor Sir Jim MacDonald, uh, and this is the very first, the, the principal of the University of Strathclyde, and this is the very first Road Ahead lecture that he has missed. But because of that, we have with us tonight the Vice Dean of Engineering, Dr. Andrew McLaren, and very welcome he is too, and I'll ask him to say a few words about the university. Dr. McLaren. Thank you, Ian. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, University of Strathclyde. I can see many of my colleagues in the audience, so maybe some of my words will uh, ring true in, uh, in their minds. So welcome to the University of Strathclyde on behalf of uh, Professor Jim, Sir Jim MacDonald, the principal, and also our executive dean, Professor Scott McGregor. So my name's Andrew McLaren. I'm the vice dean academic within the Faculty of Engineering. I'm just going to say a few words about the university by way of introduction and the Faculty of Engineering. So as many of you will know, uh, the university was founded um, in 1796 through the will of Professor John Anderson. And his vision was to create a place of useful learning. Now we're very fortunate we um, are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the granting of our Royal Charter to be a university by the, by the Queen. And this vision of a place of useful learning was to provide a university that would provide opportunities for people regardless of their status in society, their gender or their race. And we were the first university to teach engineering as a separate subject. And that mission statement to be a place of useful learning really rings true and we try to live up to that um, in everything we do today. So the university today has some 20,000 students and about two-thirds of those are undergraduates, and about a third are postgraduates. We were very fortunate, and I believe deserving, to be awarded the UK University of the Year in 2012 um, by Times Higher Education. And the next year, this current year, we are the UK Entrepreneurial University of the Year, recognizing many of our achievements. The Faculty of Engineering, where I'm based, is the largest faculty of engineering in Scotland, and it's one of the largest in the UK, providing education through over 40 undergraduate and 40 postgraduate taught programs to about 5,000 students currently within the faculty. And again, about two-thirds of those students are undergraduates. The remainder are split about 50-50 between those registered for master's degrees, um, MSc degrees, and those taking PhDs. Our research is very important to us. It underpins everything that we do, both in education and for its own benefits. Um, we have a large and growing um, research portfolio. 
we are a leader or a partner in eight centres for doctoral training. And those centres for doctoral training are government-sponsored, government-funded um, groups that train PhD students in targeted strategic areas of research. And we've recently uh, invested in some large-scale uh, industrial-partnered um, strategic research facilities, and they're listed at the bottom here. They provide opportunities for us to do research with our industrial partners in targeted areas that benefit the UK economy and the economy of Scotland. We have very strong industrial relationships, and that's really key to what we do within the faculty. Um, one of the main ways in which our industrial partners interact with us is that they support our students. So we have over 300 industrially sponsored students, and those students are provided with financial support, but perhaps even more importantly, they're provided with real-world industrial placements and internships, which underpin their education within the university um, by real experience working for companies. And many of those students, by the time they reach their final year, have already secured jobs within their um, sponsoring organizations, sponsoring companies, and this provides a really good route for our students into uh, engineering professions. We like to take our research and spin that out to share that with our partners in industry through initiatives like uh, knowledge transfer partnerships. We have one of the largest portfolios of those activities within the UK. We also do a large amount of consultancy, which allows our expertise as staff and students to be shared with industry. And we also train people who are currently working through continuous professional development. We have a very strong international outlook as a university as a whole, and as a faculty in particular. We have in the faculty over a thousand <coughs> international students from over 90 countries in the world. We work very hard at building those relationships through articulation, which means that students do their first few years of their undergraduate program in a home university at, in their home country, and then they move to the university to complete their degree or their uh, master's or their PhD. So we work very hard at those relationships that bring students into the UK to get a, 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 an education with us. And that international outlook is reflected in our staff. Our staff in the faculty, um, the academic staff, come from more than 30 different countries from around the world. So even students who come from Scotland are receiving an international flavour to their education by being informed by people um, from all over, the, all over the globe. Now one of the interesting topics, the, one of the interesting projects that I'm in personally involved with recently is a thing called the Engineering Academy. The Engineering Academy is a partnership between uh, industry, the university, and a group of local further education colleges, and the logos for those colleges are represented at the bottom of the screen. This is funded by the Scottish Funding Council to take 80 additional students per year into the university. They spend their first year in a college, and then they articulate to the second year of one of the programs within the Faculty of Engineering. During that time at the college, they undertake a, an HNC, and they also receive a, augmented skills and practical workshop experience. And this is meeting a need within industry for graduates that are fit for purpose. It's also increasing the pool of potential um, engineering graduates that we have. And it's giving opportunities to students who might not otherwise have an opportunity to go to university. So we're really, through this Engineering Academy, we're meeting, we're, we're living up to the um, ethos of our founder, John Anderson, to be a place of useful learning. We're providing opportunities to students on the basis of potential and talent rather than their status in society, and we are recognizing their opportunities to have a career in engineering. So I'd just like to take this opportunity once again to welcome you all to the university and to the faculty, and I trust that you'll enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You're all here to hear Professor Tom Devine, and it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce my very good friend, Tom Devine. He might be surprised to hear that he is my very good friend, especially as I met him for the first time today. 
In fact, as we walked past each other in the corridor, I thought, that's Tom, because I'd seen, seen him on television several times, giving all sorts of erudite lectures. Uh, I had the advantage of him, because presumably he didn't see me and my appearance in Crime Watch. <laughs> Tom is an alumnus of the university here. He has four doctorates, but my guess is that the one he's most proud of is the one that he got first here in the University of Strathclyde. He also has three professorships. And if you look in the website, you'll see that Tom's career is quite outstanding. And I, I won't attempt to summarize it. I will leave you, uh, as you've probably already done, uh, to look it up uh, and to read it and enjoy it. It's certainly very interesting. But I, I would like to tell you something about the man and how I've come to get to know him over the few weeks of just arranging the technicalities of this lecture. Of course, when you decide or want to, a lecture, or you draw up a list of people. So we drew up a list of people, obviously Tom at the top and, and various uh, lesser people at, at the bottom, and it was my task to ensnare Tom. So I phoned up his department, and well, I looked in the website first and saw that Tom was away certain days in May, but the dates weren't specified. So I phoned the department and said, uh, I see Tom Devine's away certain days in May. This is Ian White. I was just interested to know when he would be around. And I thought no more about it until the following morning at about half past six. Well, it was probably nine o'clock, but half, it felt like half past six. And, and it's a better story. And the phone went off. So I found the phone, opened the eyes and didn't recognise the number and said, hello, <laughs> as one does. And he says, this is Tom here. Quick rattle through all the Toms and didn't, didn't find one. I said, this guy sounds intelligent, so it's obviously not one of my friends yet. <laughs> so he, he said, um, he, he was still talking as you know the brain was getting into gear. And he said, I have a very good friend, Ian White, but I didn't recognise the number. And... Then, you know, he'd been talking for quite some time and then there was a pause. So it was obviously my time to talk. I thought, dear goodness, wake up. So I said, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Tom, but I'm not your very good friend, Ian White. I said, not yet your very good friend. He said, oh, well, you soon will be. So the, the time has come. And uh, I said, I just really wanted to ask if you would give the road ahead lecture. Would be delighted, he said. Uh, and that was the end of the conversation. So... There was a little bit of technicalities over the next day or two, and uh, he, he wanted another bit of information. So I, I asked for that, and it came during the evening when I was out. So I came back somewhere about half past two in the morning, probably 12 o'clock, but half past two makes a better story. And uh, I had this bit of information for him. I thought, I'll phone him up and tell him. I thought, you know, he gets up at half past six. So <laughs> I thought, no, no, you've... Uh, left your teenage pranks behind many decades ago. So I sent him a text with this information. I said, and by the way, could you tell us what you're going to talk about, something that we could use in the publicity? And off I went to bed two minutes later, and ping, the wee red light comes on in the phone, and here it is, Tom Devine, with two wonderfully crafted paragraphs on this talk, and I thought, I am not even going to attempt to answer that tonight. It can wait until tomorrow. So that, that's a, a flavour of the man. So let me introduce to you Tom Devine, the man who never sleeps, <laughs> <laughs> Scotland's leading historian, according to some, and uh, my very good friend, Professor Tom Devine. Thank you. Well, that is really that is really something, you know. That was a very generous introduction, and I'm really grateful for it. Uh, the only problem is it's entirely factually inaccurate. <laughs>
Um, but one aspect is inaccurate, is accurate, ladies and gentlemen, my delight at being asked to give this lecture, because it's the first ever time I have addressed um, a distinguished, and uh, what would be the collective for engineers, an excitement of engineers. <laughs> it's the first time ever time I've, I've ever done this. Um, and one of the reasons I really wanted to do it is to do with the nostalgia of being in this university. Um, my first ever job at the age of 17 uh, was in 1969 as an assistant lecturer in the University of Strathclyde. You believe that, do you? <laughs> um, it was certainly 1969, and one of, the, one of the, um, the courses that we ran in the history department was called the History of Science and Technology. And it was specifically for engineers and obviously many engineers being highly intelligent and sensitive wondered why they were having to do a humanities course. In fact, I, I may, it might even in those days have been compulsory. So rumours abounded about the formidable nature of this audience of undergraduate engineers. One colleague said, have you ever heard of the Glasgow Empire? <laughs> uh, the deathbed of comedians. That's what it's like. The pennies and coins going down the aisles. Serried ranks of undergraduate students reading newspapers as you speak. And then the ultimate horror. Now this, this is a classic story, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been repeated even at the University of Harvard, and it's the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris from which I have just returned. The neophyte lecturer unable to control the class, almost certainly a class of engineering students, throws down the material and says, if there's not silence, I'm leaving. He leaves and goes out of the door and finds himself in a broom cupboard. <laughs> he waits for complete silence and then exits to a thunderous round of applause <laughs> and a standing ovation. Now, even when I became deputy principal of this institution, I was still not allowed, because of my lack of expertise as a lecturer, to talk to engineers. And now, finally, I've managed, <laughs> finally, I've managed, finally, I've managed to do it. To so thank you, Ian, and you and your colleagues for permitting me to do this before I finally retire. Um, I want to do two things tonight, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, to look at a movement which has been regarded uh, as this country's greatest gift to the world, um, the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment. And I particularly want, because as I was trained by Diana's father and others in this institution, I specifically want to answer and consider a puzzle in relation to it. The puzzle being why did it happen? And I'll explain to you why that is, in fact, a considerable intellectual challenge. And then the second thing is to breach a commitment that has been safeguarded even on the Today programme, and that is to talk about the future. When Jim Nocte asked me what was going to happen in September this year, I said to him like a flash, the future is not my period. <laughs> it, took him, it took him a few seconds it took him a few seconds to react, but he then understood the comic vibration <laughs> implicit in the statement. So obviously that second part, because I'm not trained in futuristic studies, is going to be much more in the way of speculation, prejudice, assumption, and perhaps downright recalcitrance. Um, and that is, you know, could the phenomenon which occurred in the 18th century happen again? Now, by the instruction rigorous of these uh, of the organisers of this place of this uh, of this um, lecture, I have to finish by five past eight. If anybody sees me going past that, could you please raise, their ha raise your hand? I've always made it a point in all my undergraduate and other presentations to to be to time, and I may have a nervous collective breakdown if I go, go past five past eight tonight, and then we'll have some questions and comment. The Scottish Enlightenment of the 18th century was one part, it was one of the hot spots, if you will, of the general European Enlightenment of that period. 
The word enlightenment suggests the movement out of darkness. And it was an assumption by the, if you like, the thinkers of that time in the hot spots of the enlightenment, which were basically Scotland, France, some of the Italian states, some of the German states and the low countries, that they were entering a phase of new awareness, new intellectual awareness, after what they perceived were, and, and they perceived wrongly, were dark ages before, 17, before 1700. The other essential aspect of the European Enlightenment was tolerance. Now this may seem to us today to be taken for granted, but in that period which there were still people alive who had lived through the absolute horror of the Thirty Years' War of the mid-17th century. Nothing like it was seen again until the Armageddon of 1914 to 1918. And the view was that thinkers should be able to state positions, even if regarded as deviant, without fear of persecution or death or imprisonment or the Inquisition, if you like. But within that broad European conspectus, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a kind of undergraduate question this, what was Scottish about the Scottish Enlightenment? And there were certain markers which were emphatically a part of the, this country's experience. The first and the most extraordinary part of it was the collection of intellectual endeavor across the range of virtually all subjects of creativity from philosophy to geology, from architecture to poetry, from engineering science through to pure science, uh, and a lot in between, including the very seminal studies, especially emanating from philosophy, which gave, which gave root to some of the great new disciplines of what we call social sciences, sociology, political economy, history, and especially economic and social history, and anthropology. So it's the range, and the names, of course, are familiar, almost household names, beginning with one of your own men, Watt, going through Smith, Reed, Hume, and some of the, these are only the, the superstars. You're talking probably about, in terms of seminality, about 25 to 30 individuals in mid-18th century Scotland who would now still be ranked as world-changing figures in their field. And in the second aspect, unusually in this sense, was that it was a Christian enlightenment in this country. No less than seven of the literati were either ministers of the Church of Scotland or were sons of the man's. And that compares and contrasts very vividly with France, where, as Voltaire put it, écrivez l'infâme, destroy the infamous one, which was the Christian church because of the atheistic dynamic of the French Enlightenment. Whereas in this country, and as I'll try to argue later, not only was Calvinism sometimes regarded as a constraint on intellectual endeavor, vital to it in Scotia, but, on, but, not, but not simply that, that many of these individuals saw themselves not as trying to understand the world in a secular sense, but to try to understand the world in terms of, if you like, God's creation, to unravel the divine, to unravel, and that's with, a, that's with an eye, of course, to unravel, unravel the divine, to unravel God's plan. And that ranged from the physical scientists right through to the philosophers in that period. Only Hume could be regarded as a skeptic, um, but it's not absolutely certain whether he was a agnostic or he was atheistic, but he was certainly one of the top three European philosophers that the continent has ever, pro has, has ever, has ever produced. The third thing which is specific and typical of Scotland compared to all the other European, if you like, concentrations of Enlightenment thought in terms of excellence, is that the Scottish Enlightenment was based overwhelmingly 
in the universities, in the university institutions, specifically in the two colleges in Aberdeen, King's and Marshall, the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow. And of course, this institution is, is really very much a product of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. And if you take um, the Andersonian institution from the 1790s is yet another in institution of higher education. We can calculate that there were six of these places in this country at a time when there was only two in England. Aberdonians, some of you may be here. I taught in that city for a time in the late 90s, early part of the new century. I always thought Aberdonians were proud of what I would call boosterism and they'd plenty to boast about the 18th and early 19th centuries, namely that they had as many universities in their small city as the whole of England. Only one university in Scotland was irrelevant to this dynamic. <coughs> and here I apologize to graduates of saying, Daniel Defoe in the 1720s, it is looking into its grave Dr. Johnson in the 17, early, late 1770s, it is scarcely alive. I'll give you a clue. It's, a uni it's the only university in Scotland which is not close to a railway station. <laughs> and with extraordinarily, extraordinary spin, is boasting now that it's the top university in Scotia. Um, I won't say any more about that and, and because I may get into I may get into may get into trouble. We'll obviously have to come back to the role of the university in Scotland in the process of the Scottish Enlightenment, but it was overwhelmingly um, a dynamic of university men, overwhelmingly men, as you might expect in that period, and also the extension of the university men, the extension in to the house what we call now pubs, the coffee houses, and the entire social milieu, particularly of Aberdeen, Glasgow, and Edinburgh. One of the things about the Scottish Enlightenment, which if there ever is one, again, we would hope to be replicated, is it was, it was an Enlightenment based on social intercourse and a very great deal of drink. <laughs> the final thing is the impact. Because by this time, because by this time, of course, Scotland was part of the British Empire after 1707. And there was an Anglophone um, country beginning to develop across the Atlantic, which eventually became the, the world's greatest superpower, including the British Empire as then was of all time, namely the United States of America. And one of the fascinating things about the Scottish Enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen, is the creation of a bridge of boats between the Clyde and the Chesapeake as a consequence of the great tobacco trade of the 18th century. And, and uh, by the late 1750s, the three Clyde ports, the two ports of Greenock and Port Glasgow, and Glasgow itself, were importing more Virginia tobacco leaf than London, Bristol, Liverpool, Whitehaven combined. And Obviously, the volume dynamic, the volume dimension was the, the tobacco coming in and paying duty and then being sold on to European markets. But everything went out, not simply material things, but ideas. And here are two quite remarkable facts about the flow of those ideas across those, that bridge of boats. An American scholar called James McLaughlin, after many years' work, because the queen of all disciplines is very demanding of time and sweat in archives and libraries, discovered that there was 818 Europeans who had in some form of university education. This is not Brits, these are Europeans between 1680 and 1780. Of those 818, a, a, a full third had been educated in either the Aberdeen Colleges, Edinburgh, or Glasgow. It was quite an extraordinary disproportionality. These individuals were educated in the uh, halls of the Enlightenment Academy. 
and they therefore traveled. The ideas of that enlightenment traveled with them across the Atlantic. And we can see the effect of it in the creation of such institutions as what eventually became Princeton, the College of New Jersey then. It's really quite touching to go into the great chapel at Princeton and see on the right hand side the Scottish Saltire, referring back to its, its fifth great president, John Witherspoon. But there's also the University of Pennsylvania, originally the College of Philadelphia, and there's also, of course, Columbia, which was, of course, before the American Revolution at King's College. And not least, one of the prettiest of all, the College of William and Mary. But the other thing, of course, was more directly, more directly and significantly, this enlightenment process meant that incorporating, incorporated in the founding documents of the New Republic, both the Declaration of Independence and the first constitution, not alone, because those documents, if you like, were created by an intellectual toolkit, which drew on European thought, on English thought, but there was in fact a centrality for Scottish thought, particularly the views of people like Francis Hutcheson and Thomas Reid, and then eventually in the constitution itself of, of David Hume. There's a nonsense still practiced by members of the Scottish cabinet that the American's constitution was built on the declaration of our growth. There is not a shred of evidence for this, ladies and gentlemen. I delight in saying this to civil servants, but they do not delight in telling it to power. They don't because they're concerned about their career. But my trade is about truth and trying to get to the actuality. And the, the, the huge mistake is that the true progenitor the true magnum influence on the Scottish, on the American constitutional uh, documents of that period was in fact the Scottish Enlightenment. So there's no doubt about it, this is a big thing in our history, ladies and gentlemen, and it's very interesting that it was only discovered as a phenomenon and given the name the Scottish Enlightenment in 1901 by a University of Glasgow professor called W.R. Scott a kind of mix of economist and economic historian. So then we go into the puzzle. The puzzle is this, that by any standards, this is a, a flourishing of the world of the mind in a quite unprecedented way, a pre, in a quite unprecedented way. It's probably the only theme in Scottish history that attracts massive interest from scholars worldwide because the Scottish Enlightenment had such an effect on European and world thought. But if you look at it, it doesn't seem to have been grounded on fertile soil. Let me take you back to a generation before the Enlightenment process the decade before the Union, the 1690s, the year 1707 is coming up as the Union of Parliaments. In 1696, a young Edinburgh student, a student of my university, was arraigned before the courts for stating that the New Testament were, was the fables of the imposter Christ. He was condemned to death in December 1696 and executed in the grass market on January 1697. In the same year, six individuals, all of them women, were arraigned for the crime of witchcraft in Paisley. One committed suicide, one committed suicide, the rest were hanged and then burnt at the stake. After the so-called revolution or glorious revolution of 1688-9, that is, the eviction of the Stuart kings and the coming of William and Mary, William of Orange, etc., the revolution sometimes referred to, as I said, the Glorious Revolution of 1688-9, the Presbyterian Church took vengeful revenge, took real revenge on the Episcopalians and others um, by literally, you know, ending their tenure in many of the parishes and even indeed the universities. One scholar has described the rule of the kirk in the 1690s 
as Taliban-esque. So this doesn't seem to be the root of toleration, the root of deviant thought, the root of something original. So my question is this, how do we get from the world of the late 17th century to the world of Smith and Hume and Ferguson and Robertson in the middle decades of the 18th century. Now, until very recently, we're dealing with a high noon of unionism in Scottish historiography. What I'm going to say now is a to totally non-political statement. It's simply a statement of fact. And because of that, there was an assumption, A, pre-1707 Scotland was a wilderness of factionalism, was a country of intolerance of the type we've seen and a country of deep poverty. One of those things was quite correct. In the 1690s, there were five years of continuous famine, leading to a reduction of the population, especially in northern Scotland, of 25%, and a movement of nearly 60,000 people from this country to Ulster in the same, in the same, in the same decade. The failure of the Darien expedition, still requiring revisionist thinking by historians, because my argument would be it was not quite as bad as people thought, but nevertheless, it was certainly a blow. And then the constriction of the wars and the mercantilism of European powers, crushing a lot of Scottish external commerce. So by no means is this a rich country, pre-1707, and by no means is it, again, a country where you would think that at least an element of the population, the, if you like, the service infrastructure of the population would have the opportunity to think, reflect, and even be employed in positions such as that of professor or lawyer or minister or the other, if you like, in quote marks, learned, learned professions. And because of that kind of almost unionist historiographical hegemony, the only explanation that they could come up with for the Scottish Enlightenment was the Union of 1707. Aka, that a more civilized nation had touched Scotia. <laughs> and the result was the Enlightenment. Well, this, of course, now, except by a few recidivists in my own university, um, is, is regarded as nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, there was English influence, but it was pre-1707. It was John Locke. It was Isaac Newton. And in fact, the Scottish universities took up the Newtonian methodology much earlier than, um, much earlier than, than Oxford and Cambridge, again for reasons that we'll talk about later. But there's absolutely no evidence after 1707 of a knock-on English, English effect. You could say maybe there is one, such was the basic, what you would call um, um, vocal or oral insecurity of some of the world's greatest thinkers of the time that they hired an Irishman to help them how to speak proper English so that they could be understood south of the border. I mean, it's one of the great delights to read the, the reports of the trials going right through until 1815 to see some of these... Um, uh, very, very significant figures in Scottish society, the judges of the Court of Justiciary, speaking in very, very broad and semi-intelligible Scots. And of course, this didn't necessarily go down well south of the border simply because they were not comprehensible. And this, is, this was the reason for the Irish importation in order to provide the elocution lessons. So I think, I think, the, um, I think the thesis of 1707 is... is virtually dead in the water. So here, ladies and gentlemen, are what could be regarded um, in terms of modern scholarship as the, the critically important foundations uh, of what we now call the Scottish Enlightenment. There's four or five or six of them as we, as we come to them. Uh, the first is to look externally. Um, partly because of its relative poverty, at least in the medieval and early modern period, and partly because of the opportunities 
for travel to Europe by boat. Remember, this is a society where the land divided and the sea united. There was a, a tremendous level of human intercourse between this country and the European continent, and of course also inevitably England as well. And then by the 17th century with Ulster too. That, that there was um, a, a whole, I mean it was almost like a kind of nomadic group or nomadic people inhabiting this country. Um, as early as the 13th century, there is a French it's saying, rats, lice and scotchmen, you will find them everywhere. <laughs> um, now, this, this migration from this country was based to a very significant extent on mercenary soldiers. And that reached a, a high point in the mid-17th century at the time of the Thirty Years' War especially with the employment of Scottish soldiers in Scandinavia and the German states um, at, at, at that time. In my own centre of diaspora history at Edinburgh, we've calculated that the, pro the proportion of young men leaving Scotland in the 1650s was just as great as the better known diaspora of Victorian times in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. But there was, among that nomadic element, an academic dimension. Moving out for further study, sometimes coming back, sometimes settling. They were clerics, they were often lay people who were also academically inclined. The Scottish universities, three of them at least, had been established before the Reformation, but for postgraduate education it was common to go abroad. And we can, we've now got figures for about 46 European universities reaching as far away as Russia that they travelled to in that, in that period between about the 12th century and the 17th century. What was happening was this. Before the Reformation, the dynamic, the direction was towards Catholic European institutions. After it, it was mainly then towards Scandinavia and primarily the Low Countries. Low countries all come back into this equation in a few seconds. Th that, that meant that for centuries this country had been plugged in to advanced European thought to a much greater extent than England, which was distinguished by, because it was simply richer, by a greater degree of insularity. One of the most astonishing statistics that came to me during my earlier studies was between the 13th century and its foundation and the Reformation, the University of Paris had no less than 19 Scottish rectors. And the University of Paris in that period was the Harvard, was the Harvard of its day. So that's important, that fertilization from abroad. And because of the return because of the, if you like, the aggressive behaviour of the monarchy of James VII and II in the 1670s and early 1680s uh, towards committed Presbyterians. Many of them went into exile in Holland. And Holland in that period was the great, it was almost a kind of Marrakesh of intellectual activity because a lot of refugees ended up there. And so we can trace a direct relationship between some of the thinking which was mushrooming in Holland in the 1660s and 1670s, and then it coming back to Scotland via those exiles who returned. Second thing is education. I tell my students that in this period, this country was poor, but it was not backward. There's a major distinction to be made between the two concepts. And one of the reasons it's obviously poor, but one of the reasons it's not backward is because of the universalism implicit in the Noxian doctrine of the 16th century that education should be open to all. Now, this is, in a sense, a concept which is well known outside the academy. But what you don't know within the historiography is the amount of, how would you put it, um, conflict on the extent to which this became a reality. What we know is the, the, the school in every parish wasn't, didn't become a norm 
until about the mid-17th century. My predecessor in the Sir William Fraser Chair of Scottish History and Paleography at Edinburgh, Professor Gordon Donaldson, has that brilliant one-liner. By 1660, it was the normal thing for a lowland parish to have its school. Okay? That's very, very, that's very, very cunning. Doesn't say it was everywhere. The normal thing. So that was important. This was an increasingly literate society. And I would argue partly because of that, it had, unlike today's society, an in increasing reverence for scholarship. And then in the middle area, long forgotten below the university, is possibly the mo even more catalytic factor, the grammar school. Literally, the middle area for boys between the ages of 9 and 13 teaching Latin and Greek grammar. Existing before the Reformation, significant developed in the towns of Scotland after the Reformation. Very much a kind of bourgeois clientele, very much a middle rank clientele in, in, that, in that period. Draconian in its te te teaching methodology, that sector. Twice as many hours for those young lads as in the French provincial schools of the same type. They were thrashed if they were found not speaking Latin and if they were found speaking Latin and Greek, sorry, if they were found speaking Scots rather than Latin and Greek outside the classroom. Then on Sunday, they moved in to the kirk to hear the three and a half hour sermon, which they then dissected um, with their schoolmaster afterwards. This must come back. Otherwise, there cannot be a second Scottish Enlightenment. <laughs> now, one of the major conundrums, this shows you what a pathetic creature I am, one of the major conundrums I've had over the years is how did it come about that Professor Smith's Wealth of Nations, still a major challenge for graduate students, was first given as lecture notes to 14-year-olds? So my obvious, my obvious explanation was to suggest and conclude there must have been genetic decline. <laughs> but I think the answer lies in those schools. They even, mentioned, used the, they even mentioned the word, if they have the engine to continue. Grossly competitive and meritorious. You know, products of those schools, and then, those, then some of them, of course, went on, for, on to university training. No nation in the empire in this, the 18th and early 19th century could compete with them. It's maybe a wrong thing to say but I regard them as the Waffen SS of the, of the British Empire in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And then, of course, the universities in terms of education. The universities, um, A, expanded. B, in the 18th century, started to teach in English. C, became very vocational with science, engineering, law, unlike Cambridge and Oxford, who are still very much in the the classical languages, a classical, classical tradition. Um, the fees were a sixteenth of Oxbridge. There was no religious tests. American Presbyterians could come and study in Scotland, although they couldn't do so uh, south of the south of the border. Uh, so, so that was that was very important. The my current boss, the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Edinburgh is wont to say at university graduations that one of his predecessors was the last principal in Scotland to be tortured in public. This was the man um, who was probably very important, crucially important, because he'd been in Holland. He'd been in the Low Countries. Um, the man who introduced the professorial system rather than the regent system where one person taught a variety of different subjects um, into, into Scotland. So when the, 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 the principal and vice chancellor says this to an audience in the McEwen Hall, you can hear the murmurings of the staff. Why was this honorable tradition? <laughs> why, why was this honorable tradition ended? He can't hear it because you see he's got, you know, electronics in, so. There's no sign of a lazy majesty being punished afterwards. 
Um, so so, so the, the universities become more, if you like, capable of delivering the goods in this period. And then the next thing is Calvinism. Calvinism has always been seen as a constraint on this, back to Tom Aikenhead and his execution. But I, I've, try, I've tried to come around to the view of the Calvinist tradition is almost like a kind of sleeping or latent enlightenment. A, it's a cerebral religion, much more than a religion of the heart. B, it's got a very great interest in the relationship between God and man. And it's been described, therefore, as a kind of almost an early, an early social science. But the most, the most intriguing explanation of the relationship between Calvinism, the, Sc the great Scottish tradition of that period, religious tradition, and the Scottish Enlightenment, is from a man of the Enlightenment itself, John Miller, on his great work on the English Constitution, where he said that Scottish Calvinism had directed the Scottish intellectual, if you like, the Scottish intellectual mortality away from the sensuous arts, that was his words, the sensuous arts of drama, painting, and music towards the other canal intellectually of philosophy, science, engineering, architecture. And if you look at the whole panoply, ladies and gentlemen, of Scot the Scottish intellectual tradition from the 18th century almost into the early 20th century, it's not to say there aren't have been great poets and dramatists and novelists, but the overwhelming bias, the overwhelming bias of the Scottish intellectual tradition is towards those subjects that Miller described. Um, to a much greater extent, for example, than would be the case in many European countries, and especially in France and, and, uh, and Italy. And then the final thing I want, to talk, I want to suggest to you as one of the foundations of enlightenment is the flexibility that started to envelop Scottish society from the early decades of the 18th century. First, the age of moderatism in the church meant a greater liberalism of thought, a greater toleration, so people could come out and think to a greater extent than before. And then the great Jacobite risings of 1690, of 1708, 1719, 1745, 6. At the end of 1746, it was all over. The alternative to union and the alternative to the Hanoverian dynasty had been destroyed. Therefore, by the 1750s, Scottish politics had become banal. There was actually very little by the 1750s that the intellectocracy of the country could fundamentally disagree about. That, could fundamentally disagree about. But that necessarily meant, that necessarily meant that that was good ground for intellectual intercourse because the chasms of the past, of the 17th and even indeed the early 18th century, the chasms of the, of the past had been crossed and it was possible for people who might regard themselves as Tory or Jacobite or Whig to have a greater degree, if you like, of social and therefore intellectual harmony. Periods of boring politics sometimes allow for eclarismo, you know, of the mind, which of course means that we can't possibly have a, another Scottish Enlightenment today. <laughs> so let's go to today. I've got 10 minutes left. Right, the, the, um, the thing is this, that the first point I would make is that to achieve something like the middle decades of the 18th century again is probably impossible. Because, you know, so many of those disciplines were in their infancy. The great figures could, could traverse mathematics, natural philosophy, uh, and philosophy itself. And even in the interim, start to develop specialisations within them. And now we're dealing with a very highly specialist uh, academic uh, community and set of academic philosophies. I think, regrettably, there's another aspect or there are two other aspects which have negativities. Uh, one should not in any sense run down the present school system 
The OECD data, current OECD data, suggest that Scotland's number 10 in secondary school attainment compared to 30 countries. So it's not, it's not a disastrous performance. But in the 18th century, it was number one in Europe by a long, by a long, long way. And of course, there was much more in the way of per head university individuals, sorry, individuals attending university. Rarely graduating, by the way. Graduation only became de rigueur from the mid-19th century onwards. But attending some university classes and play, paying the, the class ticket, especially to some very effective teachers, like Professor Dougal Stewart, one admirer said, there was eloquence in his very spitting. <laughs> there was eloquence in his very spitting. You see, there is no evidence of any spittoon here, which is another reason why you can't have another Scottish Enlightenment. And then, of course, the other point about today is that um, uh, there's, there's not the same... I mean, this was obviously the case primarily, but not exclusively, among the middle and professional elements in the mid-18th century. A great reverence for the academy. A great reverence for scholarship. The prestige figures of mid-18th century Scotland were the men I've just talked about. When I, when I asked a collection of journalists at a, a meeting I had with them at the University of Edinburgh four years ago, or five years ago, I think it was, who was the greatest living Scot? None of them, none of them were able to say who it was. And of course, that was Jimmy Black, Sir James Black, who, uh, whose work in beta blockers has saved so many, so many lives. A Nobel laureate, and of course, no longer, uh, no, long, no longer with us. The celebrity culture of absolute vacuous nonsense compared to real substantive achievement is a major constraint. The sociology of the, of the, of, of the, the situation we live in, not, of course, restricted to Scotland, makes the life of the mind uh, something which is sometimes written off as boring. But that's not the end of it, because there are, in my view, some bright spots. And I hate to say this, but I am going to say it. It's not in my trade. It's not in my sphere of the humanities and social sciences. I mean, for example, one American scholar did say that Scottish historical studies has never been more vibrant since the 18th century. So I'm not suggesting that humanities and social sciences are inert, uh, but by any means at all. And if you take my, again, go back to my own, my own current university, the top rated area by the global, the global um, university figures and league tables, ironically enough, is not medicine at the University of Edinburgh, but by a long way is humanities which is number 15 in the world. And trailing behind it in a humiliating line is medicine, science, social science, and engineering. Sorry about the engineering. But <laughs> you can take a degree of schadenfreude that I'm not talking about Strathclyde. I'm talking about the University of Edinburgh. Um, what, I could, what, what I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a continuous line of excellence outside the Enlightenment period in applied science, in engineering, and science, which runs from the middle decades of the 19th century right down to the present day. Arrow, or Quarren Ranking, and uh, uh, Kelvin in, in that earlier period. Uh, then through the list of others, including the man whose name I can't ever remember, but he never got tenure at the University of Aberdeen, and is probably regarded, or certainly was regarded by Einstein as his primary, his primary influence. Who was that? <laughs> Correct. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> well, we'll include you. We'll include you in the vote of thanks. Um, and, and then going on to Logie Baird, Watson, Watt, Fleming, uh, right through to James Black, another Lanarkshire man, by the way. I remember when I had the honour. This is the modesty, but I have to tell you. Uh, I was awarded the Royal Medal um, by the Royal Society of Edinburgh and um, the, other, uh, the other awardee was James Black. And uh, the, the award was being given by the Queen's husband who has a, 
who has form. <laughs> and, and he said, um, I can understand why um, James is getting this, you know, because obviously he's a Nobel laureate, but why are you getting it? And uh, like a flash, Jimmy Black came in and said, well, because we're both from Lanarkshire. <laughs> he says, I'm from Uddingston and he's from Motherwell. <laughs> there was no response. <laughs> Except probably to see off stage these bloody Scots. <laughs> um, so, so, the, um, it's, so there's that line, okay? And uh, I'm not suggesting that, you know, the, 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 as I indicated before, and I'll repeat it again, I'm not suggesting that the areas that I relate to in my work um, are, as I say, inactive, on the contrary. But I detect today, especially in areas like, and this is not an order of priority, in areas like informatics, life sciences, advanced engineering, the, 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 the tremendous dynamic of collaboration between the institutions and then, as was said earlier, the spin-off into society. Now, it's going to be very difficult for the community to appreciate this because most of what you do is incomprehensible to them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not in some ways very similar to what went before. I don't think, to, I mean, this would be, this is where I break my golden rule and talk about the future. I don't think in any sense the achievement is there yet. But I very much believe, and at least certainly teach undergraduates this, as b buildings, as metaphors. And because I arrived early, I was able to walk around the campus and see that new temple, temple to advanced engineering um, and innovative thought, probably about to be called the McDonnell Building. <laughs> because, you know, the Pharaoh must leave something behind. Now, it's at, this, it's, at this point, it's at this point that I want you to ponder and possibly explain and then email me, why is he not here? Now, I think this is sinister. The excuse being made is lame. And as Ian has said, he's attended every single one of these lectures. And when it comes to a fellow Celtic supporter, he doesn't come. I, I mean, I just throw that out as a question. <laughs> so, I'm absolutely certain it's sinister, however. Now, now the, the, um, the, the, the thing I would do, therefore, in trying to, to draw this together with a minute to go, um, i just remind you that I kept the time, okay, is that um, the, the second question, the second question um, in terms of the the citation indices in relation to population size of this country. We've never been out of the top three for the last five years. And in fact, in two years, we're, we're actually the first in the world for population size in relation to the, the cit citation indicators. We know the story because it's part of the issue of debate for September that the universities in Scotland are much more competitive in gaining competitive external research awards than those south of the border. And there is that, as I say, that line of continuity, that line of men going right back to the mid-19th century to the present. And, you know, we reached the kind of apex uh, just last year um, with, um, with Professor Higgs uh, at Edinburgh with his, um, with his boss and, and with his Nobel, Nobel Prize. So I think if there is going to be a new Scottish Enlightenment, it will, it will, and I say this with bad grace, it will probably be in the area of engineering, science and medicine, or a collectivity of those, because that's really where the main world-shattering, world-leading advances up here are being made. Thank you. Absolute treat. Thank you so much.
Um, we have some time. Um, Professor Devine has stuck very rigidly to his um, and fastidiously to his um, time schedule, and unfortunately, we've got to carry on and do that with the questions and answers. We do have a couple of roving mics. Could I have those um, passed around? One at the front, one at the back, please. Can I ask you, please, to wait till the mic comes to you and identify your, your, yourself, your name, please, your company or your affiliation? Um, and I welcome questions. The lady at the second from the back there, thank you. Sarah Tiam from the Institution of Civil Engineers. I'm very struck, Tom, by the example that you give of inform informatics and life sciences uh, and collaboration really characterising uh, the, the industries that are really forging ahead. And my question for you is, uh, what of the role of learned societies, organisations, bodies like my own uh, that were set up, uh, ours in 1818, others similarly, there's a, a, an economist, Diana Coyle, um, recently who's been talking a lot about this and about the Enlightenment and about how we should be... Uh, the, the, these institutions that were set up at the time in Victorian times, what, what's the role for them nowadays? I suppose that's my question for you. One, one of the concerns I have coming from a, an institution, um, a professional body, which is uh, about a single... Uh, engineering discipline, if you like, is is there a danger of monoculture if we're all just talking to one another rather than the kind of collaboration and disruption mm. uh, which these uh, innovative industries require? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, well, first of all, um, we, we are very fortunate uh, in Scotland in having a, you know, our main learned society is unique in the British Isles, may even be unique in the world because the Royal Society of Edinburgh includes everything. I mean, unlike the British Academy, which is humanities and social science, and the Royal Society, of course, which is specifically forms of science and, to some extent, or to a limited degree, medicine. There's the Academy of Medicine. There's the um, there's the uh, the various uh, engineering bodies. Um, but the RSE, you know, is a with a small C, is very much a Catholic institution, and I think it's been dead. I think it's been quite inert until about the 1980s, perhaps early 1990s. But I now see evidence of it having a kind of galvanic effect in bringing, bringing things together. And it's already beginning to, you know, to publish reports. I mean, one of, the, one of the organizations to which I have the honor to belong, the British Academy, has been even worse. But it's now beginning to, to move out of its academic shell so I think that's, that's, that's one thing in Scotland. The second thing is it doesn't necessarily follow, in my view, that because there is a learned society or an institution which, got, which has a specific remit, that that in any sense limits it from the, uh, you know, the externality, uh, to, from, from, from going out and, and creating connections uh, with others. I think, you know, going back to the history of you know, those two which were reasonably hidebound hide until the last quarter of a century, it, it comes down eventually to the individual dynamic. You know, the people who lead the organisation and have the innovatory skills and have the, the credibility and clout out there in the world to be able to make things happen. And then the final thing I would say, uh, 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 the, the final thing I would say about the learned societies um, uh, uh, and uh, the institutions is that they're absolutely vital in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of, um, how would one put it, in terms of recognising by rigorous methodology, excellence. I mean, there's hardly any institutions in, in the country, and I mean by the UK, left, apart from these learning societies, which don't give a damn about people's reputation, but, you know, if, if it's, for example, a publication record, who look at that by intensive and rigorous peer review and decide whether or not to elect people. I mean, certainly in my own, the, 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 the organisation that I have, the, you know, belonged to since 1994, the British Academy, the process of election to FBA is actually more arduous than election to the papacy. Now, that doesn't surprise you. <laughs> Um, not that I've ever been present in a conclave before, <laughs> but
But the, but the point is, I think that's a vital role to keep up the standards. I mean, it's often said that some of these organisations, you know, um, that um, all they do is elect people. Well, that, A, that's not all they do, but that's a very important thing to give recognition to excellence. And so that would be my answer. Okay. Thank you. This gentleman here at the front. Sorry, Dave, the one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Devine. My name is Patrick Carney. Uh, I guess tonight I'm here. Uh, You're no the relation to the, the, the director of the Bank of England? No. <laughs> Probably distantly, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Some generations away. I think he's Canadian. Um, uh, so anyway, I, so I, I trained as a naval architect here at Strathclyde University. Sorry? I trained as a naval architect okay. here at Strathclyde University. And... Um, I've stuck with the maritime trades uh, since then, uh, and my family were 15 generations of fishermen. Um, so they probably had the thing passed them by uh, in terms of the Enlightenment when it first happened. But if we were looking at what we wanted to do uh, to, to create a Scottish Enlightenment, um, given some of the uh, barriers that you've talked about, mm. are there things that, that one could do, yeah. conceivably, yeah, at absolutely. least, given the powers perhaps of the current or future Scottish Parliament. Absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for that question because, you know, it's, it allows me to say something which perhaps I ought to have said during the presentation. Um, if you look back, and this is what we can learn uh, from the, from the, uh, the past, the, um, the thing I said to you was that the, the country, the nation was poor, but it wasn't backward. And partly it wasn't backward because primarily for religious reasons, not necessarily for overt intellectual reasons at that time. It created an inheritance uh, which was very cerebral um, in terms of schooling, then the grammar schooling, and then the, the, the universities. In all three sectors, probably Scotland for a given period of time, a tiny country of only 1.1 million people was ahead of the game for, in relation to other European countries many of them richer than it. Of course, what happened then by 1890, that this country was the second richest in the world after England, albeit the um, gross national product was very badly uh, mal distributed. So I would say massive investment in education at the, at the, uh, the pre-university level, including the nursery level. Looking, sending delegates to Finland to see how it's done, because they've done it. And in a sense, they're, they are very reminiscent of the, the Scotland of the 18th century. Who would have thought that the best performance results for schooling in the whole of Europe are, are won in, 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 in Finland? You know, a country which apparently doesn't really matter in terms of the European, in terms of the European dynamic. And I'm very worried also in that respect with the so-called curriculum for excellence. One of the people I admire, who was recently elected FBA um, uh, in Edinburgh University, um, the, um, the, uh, educational, uh, the educational sociologist, whose name I forget, he has described it as potentially a curriculum for ignorance. So that's dicey. I don't know whether he's right, but I, you know, I, I deeply respect... I deeply respect his views, and his name will come to me in the next few seconds, hopefully. I deeply respect his views, and I think the jury's out on that. And it will probably be out on this new curriculum for a very long time. And that is potentially, a, if, if it turns out even in a minor negatively way, it's a big wound in terms of the, you know, the, question, the question that you've, that you've asked. I would personally much rather they spent a fact-gathering fact mission to the top five performers. We don't necessarily want to become robotic because there are some countries in the world where that has happened, especially in the area of mathematics. But liberality of thought, liberality of thought, encouraging confidence in our young people, and I think there has been, there has been over the last 20 years, and I can see this with the undergraduates, there has been a very significant increase in social confidence. The only thing is, they should blend with that social confidence respect for authority. 
especially the professoriate. <laughs> I think there's another question over there, and then there's another one over here. Se the gentleman second row from the front. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Alan McDonald. My only claim to fame is I was at this university along with Jim McDonald. Um, okay, um, you can report back on him later. <laughs> <laughs> my question may have been answered previous to this by the, by the man's question in front. You said at the end of your lecture, if it could be recreated when the topic of this, uh, the lecture was, could it be recreated? Mm. If you had the powers, what would be the one thing that you could do that could create, recreate it? Well, I, I, mean, I think I've just answered yeah, that. So. Um, massive investment. The, the best teachers um, uh, encouraged, obviously you can't do it by Stalinist methodology, but the, the best teachers hopefully moving into some of the most disadvantaged areas because, you know, wh one of the things I've been working on recently is the, um, the uh, descendants of the Irish Catholic communities in Scotland their cousins in the USA reached occupational parity in 1900. They have just reached it in the 1990s. And what was the ladder? What was the route, apart from the ending of perhaps um, employment discrimination? The route was education. We have nothing left except the possibility of producing brain-intensive activity in this country. And, you know, it's not the sort of thing that's going to yield benefits immediately and maybe not even in the lifetime of two or three governments but I think that the experience of Scotia in the 18th century sorry in the 17th and 18th centuries century shows that it it can can be done and there's a lot of developed countries because I can I know this from the approaches we get in the university there's a lot of developing countries who can see the experience of 18th century Scotland and wonder you know how you get to that position you cannot replicate it, but the one thing that's a constant between that period and this is the schooling and the universities. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Robin, the gentleman down here, Mr. Masterton, has a question. I'm off, so, off the sorry, this has got to be the last one. I feel so guilty. Thanks. Uh, uh, fantastic lecture this, this evening, Tom. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Gordon Masterton, sorry. Chairman of Scottish Engineering Hall of Fame and a few other things. And... Uh, one of the challenges that Scotland faces today in greater measure than it did at the time of the Enlightenment is the global demogra yeah. demographics. You know, at the time of the Enlightenment, Scotland might have represented 0.2% of the world's population. Another, another point I failed to mention, massive international competition. No. Yes, right. indeed. And, and today, you might put a couple of zeros after the decimal point yes, in yes. terms of proportionality. Mm. Does, that, does that therefore mean it's it's impossible or is it still possible for no. a country the size of Scotland to influence or is the next no, no, thought I mean, it, change going to be the Indian Enlightenment or the Chinese No, no, no um, as I say, as long as you restrict it to the kind of disciplines that I described, I think there's already evidence that there's potential catalytic effect in those disciplines. I mean, this is a judgment. Some might say, in, you know, looking back in 50 years' time, that in the last quartile of the 20th century and the first quartile of the 21st century, Scotland, because of those international comparative indica indicators in science, medicine and engineering, made it into the top, the top flight. But the figures are absolutely there. I mean, it is astonishing that, um, you know, with Israel and Switzerland, all was in the top three, four or five in terms of percentage. Because one of the things that will keep the, the, brand, the brand flying as a flag is that most of these international indicators relate performance to the base population. If they didn't, that would be difficult, but they do. So I think there is, there is potential there. Whether it will happen, it will depend on the leadership class, which, of course, does include our absent friend. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions. Can I um, ask John, uh, sorry, Paul Goldfinch, please, to come up and deliver a vote of thanks. Thank you so much. never quite sure why it is that treasurers get asked to do votes of thanks. The world seems to work that way. Like Professor Mather and several of our audience tonight, I've been to a number of these lectures over the years, each of them organised this time of year by Engineering Scotland. 
So many of the people here, like me, know what to expect at this stage. We thank, firstly, desperately looking to find him, we thank, firstly, the University of Strathclyde, and in particular in the person of Dr. Andrew McLaren, for hosting this event. Thank you indeed, and please take that thanks back to, what was it you called him, the, 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 the absent one? We'll, do, we'll just settle for the absent one. That was determined. Deucent Babcock, specialised in supporting the, the power uh, and the process sections this, of, of our world, allowing customers the best use possible of their assets. So perhaps tonight, in supporting us with tonight's reception, they were not so far away from their normal role. Whether that or not, we thank them for the sponsorship of that. And we thank also our other and regular sponsors for this event. Michael of Scotland, joined us this year for the first time actually, purveyors of Stag's Breath, a and Bar, PLC, I think everybody could add the Iron Brew after that, but I'll play safe. Thomas Tunnick Limited and the Drambuie Liquor Company, both eponymous, and both, all of them, supporting us tonight. Then we come to the lecture itself. You have all seen my Engineering Scotland colleagues who have worked so hard behind the scenes and indeed in front of them. And you all are, as I, aware just how important to a successful event is a good audience. Remember that. Remember that we swap knowledge from one bit of engineering to another bit of engineering. That's what Engineering Scotland's about. And, of course, tonight the marker for that is James Clark Maxwell. But our final and most telling plaudit <coughs> must go to our speaker tonight, Professor Tom Devine. Tom, you have made clear to us the history of 200 years ago, 200, 300 years ago in a way which certainly I had never appreciated. And you have emboldened what it is that we as engineers <coughs> might work at to try to do our bit in bringing about a second enlightenment. That great stress on education and the enabling of education in our country. <coughs> and you have entertained us to a remarkable extent. For all those things, Professor Devine, we thank you. The more observant amongst you may have noticed that uh, Drumbuie was one of our sponsors tonight. And there was no Drumbuie, as there usually is, for you to sample the product. <clears throat> when I introduced Tom as my good friend, I did have an ulterior motive, because Drumbuie have very kindly donated a bottle of 15-year-old. Tom, would you please accept it? <laughs> I was very tempted to keep it, but he did so well, I thought we would hand it on. <laughs> I have three talks to tell you about before we, we let you go. The first is that Tom Devine is talking with or debating with Gordon Brown, that's the, the former Prime Minister, in June the 16th. The topic is Scotland's past and Scotland's present and I'll leave you to work out which is which, and that's in the McEwen Hall, Edinburgh University, or the University of Edinburgh, June 16th, and it's on Eventbrite. Uh, if you want to go, please, please go. Engineering Scotland has produced this series of lectures, and we have added a practical lecture in the spring, which is, again, very successful this year, and because of the great success of these, 
uh, our vice president thought that really we should have one in the autumn. So the autumn lecture uh, will be there. It's an innovation for this year. And please look on the uh, website uh, to find details of the autumn lecture. And unusually, we can announce that the Road Ahead Lecture 2015, would you believe, is being given by Bob Keeler. Uh, he's the CEO of the Wood Group in Aberdeen, who's coming down to talk to us, I guess, about whatever he wants, but it may well have something to do with oil and gas. <laughs> Paul Goldfinch thanked us all for what we've done tonight. He did, of course, forget one person, and that is Paul. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please come back to these uh, two lectures, the autumn lecture and the road ahead next year, and of course the, the spring lecture, the practical lecture, and don't forget Tom's in Edinburgh, June the 16th. Thank you for coming. Hope you've enjoyed it. Good night.